Okay, can everybody hear me? Thumbs up if yes. Perfect, thank you so much. Welcome, good afternoon for the ones that are in Europe, for the ones that are in Asia. Good evening and US and South America, etc. Good morning, welcome. Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues, Magnus and Leonor, that is also there just to say hi and uh, help me to welcome the people in the waiting room. And before we kick off, just a few reminders for the ones that don't know Clean Tech Scandinavia, we work pretty much to put together amazing startups like the ones that are pitching here in front of investors. So capital reach their hands and with their solutions, they can reduce uh, uh, carbon emissions and mitigate as well. So uh, thank you so much for everybody that signed up, but especially for the people that are presenting today and participating in the panels. So thank you very much for accepting my invitation. A uh, few reminders, so this works very well for all of us. As you see, uh, this is not a, exactly a webinar, so we can see each other. There is a chat, you can write. So I ask you to please monitor your own microphones, both the, the, the keynotes, the presenters, but also people in the audience. Um, for question and answers, both from the keynote session and also the pitching session, only the people in the lineup in the agenda of the event will be asking them. However, you, the audience, are more than welcome to write that down in the chat, uh, either in public or privately, or to then connect to me afterwards uh, so I can pass along your question to the to the company or to the panelists that you want to ask. Uh, and last but not least, one of the things that we do to present uh, investors and startups and vice versa is to organize events. So we have one very important event, our main event of the year coming up in October 10th, which is the Clinta Capital Day. And we have been offering until August, uh, sorry, until June, uh, sit up to 70% discount on the tickets. So I'm going to share the link here so you can check it out and, uh, and save your spot. And if you want to be part of the agenda, do not hesitate to reach out to me. So I think from all the reminders, et cetera, that's it. I would like to open the event uh, by asking Julia Sauder from uh, the Long Duration Energy Storage Council to open the presentation. Um, and uh, as I said to her a little bit earlier, I'm gonna let each speaker introduce themselves because they have quite a short time uh, to, to, to present the knowledge that they came here to share. So welcome, Julia, and thank you again. Thank you so much, Laura. It's great to be here. I'm actually calling in from the Philippines where we just signed a memorandum of understanding with the Philippine Solar and Storage Association working on collaborations and the big announcement that the government here just made for long duration energy storage. So truly is a global phenomenon to see what we're doing around the world. It's great to meet all of you. I'm Julia Souter, the CEO of the LDES Council and really excited to share with you what we're seeing around the world and just, you know, with all the renewable energy growth and all the renewable energy integration, both for behind the meter and front of the meter utility scale, what we're seeing is that we're seeing over the scale started to really expand. And so we're seeing in the next few years, the need for 180 gigawatt hours of long duration storage globally, as we're seeing all these net zero targets announced, you know, to meet our, our decarbonization goals. And so what's thrilling is to see this partnership that's starting to form. And again, we're really trying to make sure that we're avoiding all this new renewable energy curtailment and making sure we're not wasting this by providing the value add of long duration energy storage. And what there's a lot on this slide, but really just want to show that there's so much going on with long duration energy storage, whether it's in the power sector, whether it's in the heat sector, um, the fact that there is eight terawatts of long duration energy storage that's needed by 2040. What's really excited, this is a $4 trillion market that we really need to deploy and really make sure that we're meeting these goals. And in addition, we want to speak to the savings. There's $540 billion of savings that can be annually achieved when you integrate long duration energy storage in partnership with renewable energy. And it's really important to see that, you know, as we're doing this and firming the renewable energy 
we're really showing that there's a wide range to use existing infrastructure to produce the savings, whether it's transmission, distribution, energy systems, remote systems, there is this flexibility that long duration energy storage brings into the picture. We've published many reports for the Long Duration Energy Storage Council that I'll go in a little bit later, but just wanted to highlight again that, you know, as we see the integration of renewable energy really scale up and, and hitting, you know, over 60, 70 percent of, of integration, we're seeing the costs come down tremendously. And that's why you're seeing this number skyrocket of the increase of long duration energy storage and the $22 billion that's been invested in the last few years. What we're also noticing is that this energy shifting that's happening as we bring on long duration energy storage into the energy system provides this continuity, this 24 seven reliable service of clean energy with long duration energy storage. Long duration energy storage can really you know, fill in the gaps where fossil fuels traditionally had maintained services if there wasn't wind or, or sun you know, that was available that day. And now long duration energy storage, whether it's multiple hours, multiple days, whether it's months or seasons can provide this flexibility that we need to make sure that we move forward on. And I look forward to many of the panelists and the, all the technologies promote today, how they're addressing this, this market of filling in every hour of every day with clean energy. And again, the policies as we're seeing around the world are starting to adapt and change to change the criteria to really bring this cost savings to fruition. You know, when we change the policies that promote revenue mechanisms, public private partnerships, you know, bringing a lot of technologies from, you know, deployment to, to commercial to really scaling up to meet the, the customer needs. We're really seeing that there is this utilization again of the existing system. We're changing the, the planning systems, we're changing the criteria. And when we start to do this and, and really update policies, you can see the savings come in, um, you know, as soon as possible. So it's really thrilling to see that there are many ways to bring laundry sharing storage in the discussions into the partnerships, into the funding. Um, we're starting to see the societal savings because of the emissions reductions, the health benefits. Um, there's so much benefit that can come with long duration storage being incorporated into the energy systems. And just a few words about the long duration storage council. We've been working for almost two years, really bringing together this entire ecosystem of technology providers, providing this diversity of long duration energy storage and the thermal, chemical, electrochemical, mechanical sectors, you know, building upon decades of experience and um, uniting it with innovations in long duration energy storage. And again, bringing this ecosystem of integrators, developer, customers, capital providers, all justifying the need of long duration energy storage and seeing it as a critical and essential component to meet our net zero targets. And so this whole ecosystem is working together to really provide fact-based information for society's benefit and demonstrating the, the diverse need for long duration energy storage as we change our economies to address the, this new clean, clean energy transition. And so what we get asked a lot about is, well, explain to us this diversity of long duration energy storage. So I wanted to share with all of you, and you'll hear from many of our members today, the diversity within thermal energy storage and the three types of thermal energy storage, whether it's you know, changing the solid to liquid providing heat, whether it's um, sensible heat or whether it's thermochemical, there's a lot of diversity within what types of substances, whether it's volcanic rock or salts or you know, metals, there's so many different things that you'll hear about. And this diversity is really important because whether it can be you know, local needs addressing the value chain. We don't have as many supply constraints as other industries because we have this diversity and we're able to use inexpensive local resources. And electrochemical, when you talk about batteries, um, they're short duration, but we're really focusing on all these types of batteries, whether it's iron, aluminum, whether it's um, vanadium, zinc, you know, whether it's flow batteries or magnesium or organic, we really can kind of bring to, to the forefront this diversity of, of different types of, you know, 20 year assets that can really bring a lot more reliability to the system. And mechanical building upon the traditions of pumped hydro, bringing together gravity based, whether it's liquid air, compressed air, um, you know, many types of different mechanical you know, systems to build upon existing infrastructure. And you know whether it's using you know gravity to move things around blocks around or to use existing infrastructure of mines or underground caverns, you know there's a lot of diversity again at play. But we can really match the local needs again with the flexibility that long duration storage can provide um, to meet the net zero targets. And again, there's the chemical side for hydrogen. So again, you're looking at the power, heat, and hydrogen of long duration storage with a multiple hour, multiple days 
and seasons, you know, we really need to have the power heat side on your grid. And again, filling in that every hour of every day, providing that flexibility. And just wanted to highlight the, the many reports that we have on our, on our website, highlighting the public policy toolkit um, that many policymakers can use in it and incorporate it into their criteria to really update and change to address, you know, filling in the gaps with laundry sharing storage to meet the the curtailment that might happen with renewable energy and how to avoid this. Um, working with the tool of 24 seven clean power purchase agreements, how you can really have that granularity to meet every of every day. So you really can kind of see your scope one, two and three emissions being addressed. And our flagship report on the net zero power really giving benchmarking and data and background to laundry sharing and storage and really demonstrating the cost savings and the market share of the diversity of laundry sharing and storage. And building upon that, at the last COP27, we published the net zero heat report, you know, demonstrating again the $540 billion of savings and this huge marketplace for thermal energy storage where there are a lot of commercially available technologies, they just need to scale up. And one last announcement is that recently we announced the Global Renewables Alliance and we're thrilled to be part of this global industry where we have geothermal, green hydrogen, long duration energy storage, wind, hydropower, and solar all coming together to really promote the flexibility of all of our resources in this industry that we can really kind of unite to work on coordinated planning on 24 seven clean PPAs, on grid infrastructure and transmission planning changes and distribution and on just and equal transition. So you'll see more from all of us, but just wanted to really kind of share with all of you that this organization will really start to really amplify the important message of us all working together. And this is a great way to introduce and to reach out with all of you. But again, we're thrilled to see a lot of our members here presenting and look forward to your questions. And I'm really excited about the panel discussion today. Thank you so much, Julia, for your presentation. Uh, I'm gonna jump straight to Alberto now, ask him to share his screen and to talk about his findings in this area. Um, okay, now you can hear me, right? Yes. And you can see my screen. Yes, not yes. in full mode, but yes. Um, let me tackle that. We should be working now. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much as well to Magnus and Leonor um, for Scandinavia uh, for the invitation to this panel on long duration energy storage. Um, said my name is Alberto Toril and I'm a power sector manager at Breakthrough Energy in Europe. Um, for the ones that does know, uh, Breakthrough Energy is a network of investment vehicles, philanthropic programs, um, and policy advocacy that is committed to scaling the technologies that we need to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And when we're talking about technology, uh, unfortunately, let me say that we don't have a one fits for all solution. Um, so we focus our efforts on a set of breakthroughs that we believe will become the, the, the game changers to decarbonize the different economic sectors. And especially when we talk about the power sector, uh, long duration energy storage technologies are definitely one of our um, key priorities. Um, today, I would like to speak about some of the challenges that we see that are needed to be addressed to ensure the deployment of projects. But uh, first of all, um, I would like to give a little bit of a background for what we believe LDES is a key game changer for the power sector decarbonization. So um, um, focusing on, on Europe, um, we all are aware, uh, are aware that by 2030, uh, all member states are expected to reach at least 24.5% uh, of renewables in their final energy use, right? And this is only the beginning, uh, because a result of this accelerated deployment of renewables, uh, variable renewables alone, indeed, uh, are expected to reach over 50% uh, of total power sector generation in 2030 and almost 70% in 2050, uh, compared to what it is and 80% today, right? Um, what it means that this really increased the uh, flexibility need and 24 seven uh, needs um, for storage across Europe, which are often overlooked by policymakers when increasing the target for renewable energy. Um, uh, for that, we need um, specifically energy storage and all type of um, long durations, or all type of duration for energy storage. So on one hand side, lithium ion batteries uh, market has been developing rapidly in response to short term flexibility needs. And that's great. Uh, there are now around uh, 10 gigas of batteries installed in Europe, but it is expected to rise around 57 gigas by 2030, right? But meanwhile, there has been little attention to storage need beyond eight hours and projects are still nascent. 
uh, despite the system benefits uh, that long duration energy storage provide, um, projects in the EU still struggle to reach FID. And uh, for that, I would like to uh, uh, dive a little bit more on what are the, some of the challenges that we that we see, as I was um, commenting. So um, in terms of challenges, uh, let me say that there are numerous ahead that are preventing LDES technologies from getting the attention that they deserve and at least their full potential. So they range from gaps in regulation and market incentives, uh, financial hurdles, and demand side levers. Sometimes even these barriers are tied to regulatory decisions at the European level that are not easy to steer and modernize, like the ones that are preventing, for example, TSO from owning uh, storage assets in the power grid. So let me first come to regulation, and let me first say that our regulation needs to provide long-term visibility for storage. Um, the long duration storage market needs to have a tangible capacity market, uh, deployment targets, let's say, uh, that could guarantee market stability and allow investment to flow in, right? Um, but highly interlinked with this, market needs a standard definition for LDS technologies and the appropriate market incentives that recognize and monetize uh, on one hand side clean firming capacity that they can provide to the revenue or intermittency, but also the additional services uh, that other technologies cannot provide, right? Um, whether they are system inertia, ancillary services, heat supply, as Julia was um, was commenting to industries uh, to decarbonize uh, their processes, uh, well, depending on each of the technologies categories that um, Julia was describing in her presentation. So it is important overall that these market incentives are consistent and therefore designed at the European level, right? Uh, to ensure a fair competition and a faster deployment of long duration energy storage project that ultimately will reduce the European gas consumption, right? And in this sense, uh, let me say that we very much welcome the European Commission proposal as part of their um, electricity market design um, 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 release on uh, March 14 that was bringing up flexibility and placing storage as a key element um, to provide them, right? Um, although these measures can be a strength uh, and further improve, we believe that this is a very good step. So on the demand side, um, we uh, truly believe that we must activate levers uh, like the 24-7 TPS mechanisms to allow off-takers a full round-the-clock clean energy supply from these technologies, right? And to include LDS technologies um, to ensure the clean electricity is supplied even when the sun does not shine and when the wind does not blow, right? And finally, on the finance side, uh, we need to continue uh, to fund R&D um, and allocate sufficient budgets to LDS technologies. And when the projects are ready to scale, uh, we need targeted instruments that can help uh, the risk these, these, these projects. Um, um, so for these advances to be materialized, we need a common European strategy that provides the necessary long-term signals for innovators, um, investors, and developers to move forward projects deployments and ensure we reach the European decarbonization objectives, right? And for that, uh, at Breakthrough Energy, um, we uh, do a set of different um, activities in terms of uh, policy advocacy, um, but um, that I will be happy to enter maybe uh, more into details for the sake of time or into the, to the, to the discussion, but uh, let me briefly to, to mention that to advocate a uh, solution for all of these challenges that I was commenting, um, Breath to Energy alongside Solar Power Europe, Wind Europe, and the European Association for Storage of um, Energy uh, jointly launched the Energy Storage Coalition um, a couple of weeks ago in Brussels, uh, content with the presence of and support of uh, the EU Energy Commissioner, uh, Kadri Simpson, that it's aiming to um, provide advocacy at the European level, um, you know, to all durations and all type of storage to be able to um, accompany and further accelerate the deployment of renewables that we need to decarbonize our power sector. Um, with that, I will just leave you here. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you again, Alberto, and uh, hang on for the panel discussion. There are questions for you. Uh, I would like to welcome Ninon now for her presentation. Ninon is from EDF. Yes, hi. Uh, can you see my screen? Not, yes. not in full uh, screen, right? No, it's okay. Okay, so nice to meet you all. Thank you, Cleantech Scandinavia, for inviting EDF to discuss uh, long duration energy storage with such a great panel. Glad to be a, a part of it. I'm Ninon Lamarck, uh, Investment Director at EDF Post Venture, and I will start with a very quick introduction about EDF and EDF Post Venture. So EDF Group is the first low carbon electricity producer and uh, aims for CO2 neutrality by uh, 2050. Wherever our group uh, operates, we want to invent a new energy model to address the climate crisis, uh, which means lower carbon, more efficient, less of an impact on the environment and on people. And as mentioned, I'm um, in the EDF Post Venture team and uh, EDF Post Venture manage the EDF Group Venture Capital Fund. 
our mission is to identify and invest in new businesses and innovative solutions developed by startups to help lead a carbon neutral future. We have invested around 4 million euros in 2017. We have 17 startups in our portfolio, and we usually make a three to five investment per year. So to achieve the carbon neutrality faster, it is imperative to increase the share of low carbon energy in the global energy mix. So EDF Group, leader of low carbon energy production, uh, thanks to renewables and nuclear energy, is thus positioning itself as a key player in the energy transition. As its energy becomes more and more important in the electricity production, new ways might be found to ensure that the electricity system works properly at all times. So long duration energy storage is one of the solutions. Faced with this emerging trend, we have carried out a deep dive to assess the geographic distribution of the demand, to identify the technology that can meet these needs, while drawing up an inventory of relevant startups in this field. Technology. So, sorry. So the most mature technology is that of pump storage hydropower (PSH). A technology that EDF has mastered for many years. So, in our deep dive, we have studied six other technologies, more specifically, on which many innovative solutions are emerging. We have identified hundreds of companies developed uh, these different technology. Among them, 46 startups illustrate the dynamic of the ecosystem on the six uh, technology paths analyzed. So first, adiabatic compressed and liquid air energy storage is a promising technology. Um, energy is used to compress air during charging, which is then expand in a turbine to produce electricity. It could store for between six to 100 uh, hour in uh, an underground cavity, depending uh, on the technology used and, and the size of the cavity. Um, redox for batteries, because this kind of batteries consists in two tanks in which two chemical compounds are dissolved and then punted into an electrochemical cell that produce an, elect an electricity current. It can also store energy for between 8 to uh, 44 hours, and they are becoming more mature and need to meet the challenge of competitive competitiveness. Uh, following with solid gravity-based solutions that are using the potential energy of a mass. Unlike uh, PSH, this technology uh, relies on solid masses. So during discharge, the potential energy of the falling object is converted into electricity by generator. Only a handful pilots, but this type of technology allows energy to be stored for 8 to uh, 24 hours. Hydrogen, of course, uh, it is possible to store energy in the form of hydrogen, whether solid, liquid, or gas. Today, this is the solution offering the longest storage time, apart from technology excluded from the study scope. Also, evolution on lithium ion batteries. This is a fairly mature technology with two implementation constraints but relevant for a fairly short storage time between one hour uh, and up to six or eight hours. Its compact size doesn't require a particular installation environment, lower cost of new batteries, and the use of second life lithium-ion batteries could be two ways of this, for this technology to be uh, maybe competitive uh, over a longer period. Thermal storage as well, electricity converted and stored at, as heat in a medium with or without phase changes. This heat is then either used directly or uh, to generate electricity via a turbine. This can store energy for 8 to 24 hours. And uh, another technology exists, such as uh, liquefied uh, CO2 storage, uh, metal air solution, and uh, of course, uh, new chemistry. Hi, Nino. Um, you're done with our presentation? Yeah. Thank you. 
So moving on to now a neighbor right around the corner here, Madeline from Alpha Laval. Yes. Please confirm that you see correctly. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you all uh, and also for inviting me here uh, to this webinar today to talk about long duration energy storage. So my name is Madeleine Gilborn. I'm the head of clean technologies and also vice president of our energy division in Alpha Laval. And I also have one of the board seats in the Long Duration Energy Storage Council working together with Julia. And see, uh, so to be able to re reach net zero targets by 2050, according to IEA, almost half of the emission reduction will come from technologies that are today in a prototype or demonstration phase. And one of those examples are just long duration energy storage. Uh, and we see that we need a long term focus and a system thinking approach to accelerate the deployment of these technologies and both to scale them, but also to commercialize them. And this is going to need a lot of investments to become a reality. And as we also heard from Julia before, according to the Elders Council, eight terawatt of long duration energy storage is needed already by 2040 to keep the world on track for limiting the impact of climate change, but also to enable the transition to renewables to handle the intermittency. Uh, and there are now 10 countries who has an energy storage target as part of their net zero plans, which is a good start, but we are nowhere near the, the sort of um, pathway we need to be to be um, development on, on in time. And LDS offers a clear, uh, clean flexibility solutions to secure both the power and heat reliability. And it's therefore important to recognize that all of the long duration energy storage technologies are required as all of these technologies are suited in different applications when it comes to net zero transition. So it's not uh, a discussion of which of them, it's a matter of how they all can be deployed in time. Our view is that long duration energy storage is twofold. So if you think first about the utility grid scale, we need to realize that the majority, majority of these projects are still in pilot or demonstration phase. And this is where we need to deploy, we need to scale, and we need to commercialize. And we need to industrialize in order to bend these cost curves of these technologies to make these LDS technologies cost competitive to fossil fuels. And we also have to think in modernization to allow us to scale fast enough to reach the net targets of net zero. These projects are large utility scale and they have high complexity and they require long-term commitments. So funding and policy support are required to do risk investments, but we also need to find ways to reward flexibility. So permitting needs to be significantly simplified and also speeded up. And we also think a key success factor here will be the per, uh, power purchase agreements, as Julia mentioned, because greenfield projects have a high capex and a very, very long lifetime, talking about 30 years. On the other side, short term, there are immediate opportunities to decarbonize industrial heat to thermal energy storage. We often talk about decarbonization of electricity, but heat is the main piece of the puzzle, as heat represents 45% of the energy related emissions and or even 50% of the global energy consumption. And thermal energy storage can decarbonize heat applications such as steam or hot air by electrifying and firming heat with renewable energy sources. And these technologies uh, for various heat applications are already available, they are proven, and they are also cost competitive. So I would like to say that the future is not limited by technology itself, it's limited by our willingness to accelerate the implementation and deployment of these flexibility solutions. So what is Alfa Laval's role in long duration energy storage? So Alfa Laval is a world leading manufacturer of heat transfer equipment. And as you can see by these process designs illustration, it does not matter if we are talking power to power, if we talk power to heat, mechanical energy storage, or for that matter, long, uh, liquid uh, air. Uh, heat transfer equipment is in the heart of the process and is often the most critical component of the system. And heat transfer solutions are therefore a key enabler to LDS. It provides scalability, energy efficiency, and it creates affordability of these solutions to make them able to industrialize. And we offer today the broadest portfolio of heat transfer equipment, 
both existing solutions, but also new innovations that can handle the new type of requirements that storage provide, such as cyclicality, uh, handling all types of media, such as liquids, salts and gases, but also the extreme temperatures of both being very high, but also very low. And again, we cannot no longer take energy for granted uh, going forward, and energy storage has to be co cost competitive. So we need to think energy efficient design already from the start. It allows for optimized round trip efficiency. It reduces the levelized cost of storage. It optimizes the, the, optimize the system itself, and it's allowing the ability to recover the excess heat or the waste heat. So once again, for me, it's very important that we have a system thinking approach when we consider energy optimization. And again, it's about both the power side and the heat side. So we play an important role, role when it comes to industrialization of long duration energy storage. So finally, we believe that partnerships and collaboration are key to the acceleration of LDS and to reach this in time. We think it requires partnerships across the entire value chain, and we need this system thinking approach to enable cost competitive LDS technologies. And Alfa Laval as a company has been active in energy storage since 2018, when we became a minority stake investment and technology partner to Malta Inc. Since then, we are working actively through partnerships with several LDS companies, such as here, a few examples, uh, Reagan in Australia, we have Kyoto who comes here just in a minute, but also Built to Zero. For new innovative heat transfer technologies to support them in industrialization, but also how to become cost competitive. You will also see we are a founding member of the LDS Council, uh, where we support to drive the acceleration of deployment of these technologies, because we really believe collaboration is a key enabler to drive this change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline, for your presentation. And last but not the least from the keynotes, I would like to ask Carl to jump in. Carl Anton from Verbund. Yes, thank you. It was a good afternoon from my side. I try to share my screen. Uh, if it was not the right one, I'm very sorry. So. No, it should be. So good afternoon. Uh, yeah, my name is Karl Zach. I'm uh, from Verbum, from the Innovation Department, uh, more specifically Corporate Innovation and uh, New Business. Um, I'm uh, in this field, in this regard, I'm working on the one of uh, Verbum's innovation focus field, namely in the, in the field of new storage. Yeah, I'm happy to be here today and to give a little bit of an overview of what Verbum is doing in the field of long duration energy storage. So first, a few words uh, about Verbund it, uh, itself. So Verbund is Austria's leading utility uh, um, with uh, around one, uh, with 129 uh, hydropower plants uh, in Austria and in Germany, having a, a power capacity of 8.2 gigawatt and uh, a storage capacity uh, with its pumped hydro and, and storage power plants in the Alps of 1.8 terawatt hours. Additionally to that, uh, Verbund is also operating uh, wind and PV farms, and uh, the target of Verbund is to, to boost this capacity uh, of this generation of wind and PV up to 25% uh, up to the year 2030. In addition, in Verbund, uh, there is also the, the Austrian um, uh, power grid, so the Austrian transmission system operator for the electricity, high, uh, high voltage grid, and also the Gas Connect Austria, the high pressure natural gas grid operator. Verbund in its uh, current, uh, in, in, the, in the strategy, uh, relies mainly on these three pillars you see here. So on the one hand, uh, Verbund wants to expand uh, the renewables in, in, in Europe, as said, in the year 2030, up to uh, one fourth of the total generation capacity should uh, rely on uh, wind and PV. There's the second pillar, Verbund wants to position itself as a European hydrogen player. So green hydrogen uh, is seen as one well as the key to the energy transmission and uh, transition and uh, the decarbonization, especially in the industrial sector. And as the third pillar, 
the strengthening of the integrated domestic market. Um, the domestic market for, for Bundes uh, said uh, Germany and Austria, where we already are the leading hydropower generator. When looking a little bit more specifically uh, what Verbund is doing uh, in uh, the field of long duration energy storage or the field of, of storage uh, of energy storage uh, in general, uh, you see that Verbund has a long history of uh, operating uh, large hydropower uh, plants in the Alps. So pumped, uh, pumped hydro storage as well as storage plants. As already said, uh, a total, a total storage capacity of 1.8 terawatt hours is already in place, and Verbund is still uh, up, upgrading and investing heavily in uh, in uh, um, additional in additional power capacity uh, in the pumping and, and turbining mode of these facilities and investing uh, 500 million euros in the next years to to expand this section further. In addition to that, uh, Verbund has also deployed uh, many uh, uh, short duration energy storage systems, so lithium ion batteries in Austria and Germany. So at the moment, um, Verbund is operating uh, about 100 megawatt uh, of, such, uh, of such batteries in, uh, in Germany and Austria. And also had, this, had set itself the goal to, uh, to additionally in, or to install one gigawatt of, of these kind of battery energy storage systems up to the year 2030. You see at the moment, most of these uh, short duration uh, storage systems are uh, operating or operating mainly as for the for grid services. So the main business case there is grid services. So participating in the different grid services market as uh, frequency containment reserve uh, in Germany and Austria. But also there are some peak shaving applications in an industrial environment, as well as for immobility e uh, charging hubs. So as seen, um, Verbund is already very active in the storage in the storage field, and uh, for for the, for the strategy to move forward, also in this respect to concerning new storage, uh, we mainly foresee uh, we foresee three different uh, main approaches at the moment. So, uh, of course, the, the biggest challenge we are facing, which was already mentioned uh, several times uh, today, is the massive increase of renewables, and this will lead to a significant rise also in the demand for, for flexibility. So, when you look at the different market studies, I think uh, also from the Long Duration Energy Storage Council, you see that there will be a great market potential also for this innovative storage solution in the field of long duration energy storage. and. Uh, at the moment, most of the storage devices, uh, as said, are more or less operating for the provision of grid services and also for this uh, provision of behind the meter services, mainly so some, uh, some kind of, of peak shaving and so on. And this is already done by our business units at the moment. And uh, this is already on a commercial basis, let's say. And for us, from the, from the uh, innovation department uh, point of view, we are more looking at the storage of, uh, for the integration of renewables in the future. And especially in this sector, we see that uh, these new kinds of, of technologies, which were also highlighted by EDF in the presentation before. So these uh, new kinds of innovative storage solutions are also quite interesting for us. And we want to move forward here and also pilot these new uh, storage uh, technologies, also in Verbund to gain more knowledge about the operation of such systems and also to facilitate their deployment in the future. So that's so much from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl. So now the panel discussion, we have uh, not enough time, I'm afraid, but I hope that we can utilize uh, the 20 minutes that we have. Uh, and Julia will be the MC, the ceremony uh, uh, of the, this panel discussion. So Julia, please go on. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So it was wonderful to hear all the panelists speak to the need for flexibility and how the diversity of long duration energy stores can provide this. I'm going to jump right into questions and ask, you know, and first, um, you, you mentioned that you are looking at, you know, this, the wide swath of diversity of projects, but I'm curious, um, you know, as you're looking at the different geographies, can you tell us a little bit more and then what specific projects do you have within the EDF group that focuses on long duration storage? Yes, of course. 
So there is several initiatives and, and projects uh, exist in EDF Group on, on long duration energy storage, essentially involving um, entities such as EDF Energy, the International Division, EDF Renewable, of course, and Edison, for example, on very various geographies such as UK, USA, Italy, Chile, and South Africa, etc. Um, but this project, to be honest, right now, um, they are currently at the proof of concept or demonstrator stage, and they cover various technology, um, to be honest. No, thank you. It's, it's, it's great to see a lot more of the um, partnerships, as Madeline was saying earlier, kind of come to fruition and really start to elevate the different companies in the forefront. Madeline, you were talking about system thinking. Can you expand a little bit more about your investment strategy and your role in commercializing long duration energy storage? Yes, of course. So when I'm talking about system thinking approach, for me, it's about to have to think of it from an energy perspective, right? So we have to look at it. It's very easy to think power to power and we think about the electricity need, but we have we often forgot about the heat side. So when we think system thinking approach, we need to think about the complete energy system and can take both into consideration when we move forward as well. But not only for the energy itself, but also to allow us to reduce these costs to come down to really make attractive both solutions here, right? As from an Alfa Laval perspective, uh, we don't have a venture capitalist fund in that sense. Uh, we don't have a VC arm ourselves, but we do have an arm for minority stakes investments. And this is where we go in uh, typically around series A, I would say uh, normally, when the technology itself is rather proven, but where we could contribute with our knowledge of knowing how to industrialize something. When we're looking at the large scale, how can we take the cost to come down from a system thinking approach? Uh, and then we, we, when we do minority stakes, we are taking a very active role. Um, but we also, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, think that partnerships is key. So it doesn't have to be minority stake investment. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and building upon the systems thinking, and Carl, your decades of experience for Vubond, well, can you explain a little bit more about some of the pilot projects that you're working on and what kind of LDS technologies really are, are in your additional storage mm -hmm. portfolio? Yes, for sure. Uh, so at the moment, we are more or less working on two specific uh, long duration energy storage pilot project. So one is um, one is uh, at the moment a feasibility study. So it's a combination of a thermal energy storage system with a gas fired power plant. So the last gas fired power plant within Verbund, uh, where our aim is to you know save CO2 and uh, CO2 emissions and uh, natural gas by storing uh, heat in the thermal energy storage from, uh, from the ramp down process of the gas turbine and also by using power to heat. The main challenge there we are facing at the moment is that the forecast for natural gas and also for CO2 prices are not in favor of doing, of doing the such investments. Uh, but anyway, it's a quite interesting uh, project. And uh, the second project was a little bit further advanced. So we are in the, in the middle of a, a request for proposal uh, for a long duration energy storage system uh, in combination with the wind farm also in, in uh, lower Austria. Uh, where we dedicated, where we, we are really looking at uh, long duration energy storage sy systems, uh, which, which can store electricity and also give, uh, give out electricity again. So specifically at, at electricity storage in this regard, um, will be also quite interesting for us to see how it, uh, how well we can, how well we can. Uh, move ahead also with the local authorities, because uh, as I said, this is also a, quite a, a challenge if you're facing such new technologies and how to handle them. Um, yeah, but these are the, the main two um, pilot projects we are, we are looking at the moment. And yeah, concerning the technologies for us, it's very important to have this, this uh, the, well, for us, it's, it's the focus on the storage of electricity because we are, as we are a utility and we only have one thermal energy storage system left. And this combination of, of uh, wind PV and, uh, and storage gives for us the most, uh, or, or has for us the most, most use in the future, also concerning our, our deployment uh, in, in our markets where we're active. Thank, thank you, Carl, for highlighting that you know, local needs, local opposition, how to navigate the, 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 the various policies that everyone's kind of brought up and the fact that we look forward to both pilots being successful to continue to carry the story along about the, 
addressing energy security, reliability, and flexibility. And that kind of comes to the market mechanisms, Alberto, you, you raised in your presentation with those three circles of regulation, demand side, and R&D. Can you speak a little bit more to, you know, what are some of the transitional pieces and market incentives that are really going to be needed for long duration energy storage? Of course, I'm happy to do that. <clears throat> So first of all, um, if we partly discussing, you know, in the European um, market design uh, reform, um, and as part of that is how to address flexibility, right? With this um, ramp up of variable renewables coming um, online and the need for, uh, you know, even a more electrified uh, demand side um, of the power system, uh, we need to match uh, those supplies and demand, right? And for that, I mean, we, we need some sort of, you know, a backup reliable enough to be able to, you know, get um, uh, in the future soon, hopefully, you know, get the gas fire plant out of the power mix while, you know, ensuring that, you know, we keep the levels of energy security, you know, up and running, right? Um, so we see different of mechanisms that are being discussed, you know, from the capacity markets, you know, and how to, um, you know, promote the role of this long duration energy storage alongside other technologies, for sure, we will need interconnections, we will need, you know, um, the mindset management, we will need some other things, but, you know, particularly for long duration energy storage, how we promote the role of them, right, um, and to compete against, you know, um, the, what it's providing right now, the backup for, for the system, right, and for that, I mean, there are central ways that you know the market can be incentivizing that you know uh, we will be speaking in the future about CFDs for storage. We will be speaking about you know hybridization of PPAs, uh, you know with renewable plants to provide these round the clock uh, supply we're mentioning. But um, overall, uh, this all for us uh, falls into the idea that we need. Uh, long-term targets, um, you know, as a market signals. Um, you know, in terms of where we are seeing these first signals moving on, I mean, we are concentrated, you know, um, part of our work, uh, we are talking about Europe in Spain specifically, and we we, we liaise with the government here because this this has been the first COVID, the first member of the state to put targets uh, towards deployment to 2030. And that for us, it's, you know, um, um, expertise that, that, that can be translated into other markets and can replicate, you know, the manner. I'm not saying that this is everything done, right? But it's the first steps more on, moving towards, you know, long-term signals that can start, you know, hedging some of the risks for, you know, these corporates that are needed to provide the, 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 the capital towards the projects and therefore, you know, um, start the, the, let's say, the deployment of the first um, um pilots in here and and we pretty much advocate for that um you know at the um, um international level um they mentioned we partner um with long duration and yesterday's council um you know advocating uh, you know and providing insights you know um not only in europe but as well in you know in the in in, in the united states i mean on how to uh, you know this market i mean um, can be uh, taking the leap on but particularly for 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 europe as i was saying spain is some sort of the first mover but as we have seen as well with china in Germany, um, you know, for a different reason that it's, you know, um, a shortage of gas supply, you know, and especially, you know, what is going on, uh, what is going to happen, you know, for the next winter. So we see some of the market signals, you know, happening as well at the member states, you know, in different regions, but therefore, I mean, this should be, as I was um, um, I'm saying at the beginning of the presentation, this would be something that, you know, um, should be done at the European level and therefore, you know, uh, ensure a fair competition into the, you know, I meet in member states. Thank you, Alberto, for weaving together what's needed in the EU, but also what's happening around the world and kind of global pressures and also insights that can be gained. So I'm curious for EDF, Alpha Laval, and Verbund, you all have multiple countries that you're working in. Is there a parallel that you want to bring into this conversation or something that you really want the EU to make sure that they do in the next um, the next market discussion that they're having? You know, do you want to go first? Yeah, maybe um, during the deep dive, we have also uh, applied a number of criteria, uh, such as grid constraint, renewable mm -hmm. penetration, uh, flex, flex need, uh, wool scale price volatility, to, to maybe have a view on the, the, needs, the needs according to the to geography uh, and to um, kind of evaluate the potential development of EDS. In a, in a number of geography related to the group activities. So Spain was not part of the study, but depending on the use cases, but um, mainly California, the UK and Italy appears to be the, the most attractive in, in Europe. Again, uh, Spain yeah. was not part of the study, but uh, for, for us, it's, uh, it's our view right now, again, depending on the use cases. And, uh, and I think, uh, 
for heat solution, there is uh, of course uh, many uh, many places where it could be uh, it, could, it could make sense. Well said. Yes, I think that the opportunity for the diversity of laundry sharing storage is really important to have the right criteria, and we need to expand the criteria to make sure it captures all the benefits that you've all noted that laundry sharing energy storage can provide. Madeline, Carl, would you like to add some more to this? Um, I, I think I agree a lot to what has been said here, and I think what you have to realize is that this is a technology area that is quite complex, so it's also about um, educating that there are some things that are long term, such as the power utility grid scale, but at the same time communicating that there are also opportunities here and now that does not require it, because you can also be a little bit afraid when you hear some of this, that this is very long term, you need a 30 years agreements, you need a lot of reg regulations, you need a lot of funding. So I think having this clear message that it's two different things and there are multiple technologies uh, and they all are, they all needed, right? Because it's not the game to whether it's this or this. Um, I think that's also a very important message to comfort. Um, right, it's not us versus them. The the pie is so much bigger now for, and we need yeah. everything and to put in there. Um, yes, and then I, I just agree with Alberto. I think this the main thing here is to put the targets and make sure we have the long term agreements. As soon as you have the long term view and the commitments, that's when the industry can also start to act and put their announcements. But as long as you have that commitment and the long term targets, it's very, very difficult. You will still see this as pilot and demonstrations. I think that's what we need um, to get things going. Cool. And Carl, you were speaking about this earlier with the pilots that you're doing. Did you want to add on to the portfolio? Exactly. I mean, for, for us, as we are, we are currently looking at different markets also, so I said uh, for us, the first pilot would be in Austria, but for future pilots or for future scaling of, of such solutions, we are especially looking at Spain and Italy, where we recently also started our business there or our businesses there uh, as well in uh, Romania, Albania. I mean, there, there are some very interesting markets and for us, it's always a challenge if we move to another market or if we look at the, the use cases there always to see also the, the regulatory environment there. And this might this is currently very different and very heterogeneous, heterogeneous between the different markets. And this makes it very, very difficult also for us to really assess the value of the of the storage solution there. And this makes it also quite challenging for so for us it will be very uh, very in favor if 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 certain regulations are are the same and uh, and um, you know there, there's a level playing field also between these different kinds of flexibility in in all the markets thank you for highlighting bringing the level playing field forward i think that is really critical and the the hardship of communicating how clearly that LDS can meet these needs, but you also have the what's available today and what's available in five to 10 years and making sure that we have the runway to make this work. So knowing that Laura wants to make sure we get to all these great technologies and the, the form that we're having next, I want to ask each of you to kind of give your one last message of, you know, to, to the global market, to the EU, to the investors on the phone, you know, what is it about LDES that makes you thrilled that this is part of your, your portfolio and your toolkit? Alberta, I'll start with you. Since you're investing in a lot of the companies. Yeah, I haven't talked about the companies we invested, but we have a plethora of um, investments done in different technologies, but as well, not only in companies, but as well in projects. We're saying that, you know, uh, there was a network of uh, philanthropic programs that, you know, we are investing, you know, and trying to reduce the risks in, I mean, as Carl and, and Madeleine is saying, you know, in some of these first projects, I mean, being able to be bankable. So to me, the message is like, let's focus on making these projects bankable. I mean, for us, LDS is a no brainer decision. Uh, when we are talking about full decomposition of the power system and you are totally right, Julia, there might be places where, uh, you know, technology um, um, is ready and others would be in the next five years, but uh, we should start thinking on how we combine the variable um, intermittent um, production from a generation from our renewable. So um, let's focus on making these projects bankable and let's get all hands on deck. Uh, we we'll need a, as well a whole range 360 uh, vision of you know off takers, very important um, you know for very these very first projects, but as well financiers, but as well technology to be promoted there. So um, you know this is an effort um, you know collaboration. I don't know who was the one who was mentioning collaboration at the beginning, but fully aligned with that, right? Um, so um, collaboration towards bankability. Uh, great, Carl. Nice transition. Yeah, for, for us, I think it's quite, quite clear that the, the long duration energy storage will be 
one means of flexibility, one very important means of flexibility in the future, and is, is needed. And there are certain different kinds of technology solutions in this in this regard. And uh, it's always there will always be a mix between the, the different solutions there. And for us, it's really important to have or to to really be able to form a, a viable business case as uh, as a utility, of course, uh, for such technologies. And this is the one main thing that we are currently missing a little bit. And that's why we are currently more or less in the piloting uh, in, or piloting technologies and not re already scaling them up, it, uh, even though we see that there will be a need in the near future. And we're glad to see you jumping in to be part of the solutions and the, the dialogue today to make sure we advance tomorrow. Madeline. Well, um, I think, uh, I mean, LDS is the piece of the puzzle in this net zero transition that has not been given the attention it deserves, I think. I think this is one of those areas where we need more attention and we still have a lot of investments that needs to go into this. And I agree with Alberto, for me, I mean, let's make this utility uh, grid scale projects bankable. I think that's really where we should spend the focus, uh, industrializing them and making them bankable so we can scale uh, fast. Uh, and then I'm coming back to it again, but I think the other part is not to forget that thermal energy storage is addressing the heat side, which is 50% of uh, the climate problem here from an energy perspective. Mm -hmm. And these are technologies that it's all about implementation. So um, raise the awareness that this is commercially available today uh, to address the industry aspects of this. Great, and Ninan. Yeah, so I agree with uh, everything uh, that's been said, but uh, maybe to, to add just uh, at EDF, we, we will be very happy to, to make some, I, I heard some collaboration with our subsidiaries and also to, to invest, of course, in startups to help them to grow. Because uh, again, uh, we think it, it's a key topic for the, for the next year and to help to, to decarbonize the, the mix. So, so don't hesitate to, to, to reach out. Great. I think that was a wonderful open door for a lot of the technologies to come make sure they're part of the process. So it's been a great panel discussion. We've heard about, you know, collaboration towards bankability, about the means of flexibility and diversity and how you de-risk the transition. We've heard about the importance of power heat and you know, really addressing societal needs by decreasing emissions. And we've heard about the, um, you know, LDS is, LDS is part of the piece of the puzzle and it needs more attention and that we really need to collaborate and know that there are investors out there that want to continue to build and scale up from the pilot stages. So again, thank you to, to Lauren Clean Tech Scandinavia for really bringing this together, highlighting the essential need of LDES and looking forward to all these amazing technologies and companies that are here today to present all the work they're doing and the realities of what they've accomplished so far and look forward to supporting them on their journeys. Thank, thank you so much, thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thank you so much uh, for this first block of our event today, Julia, for your excellent moderation. So we'll be in touch. And uh, to all the others that are members of Clintex Scandinavia and partners of Clintex Scandinavia, thank you again. Um, so jumping to, let's take a look at the technologies that are out there and the people that are actually doing it. So let's um, first start by introducing the panelists. So two of them, we already know, the Madeline and Ninon are gonna hang on and comment and ask questions to the, this company's presentations. But I would like to ask um, Carl's colleague to present himself, uh, also from Verbund. Lucas, can you just tell us a little bit about you and uh, what you do at Verbund? Hi, Laura. Thanks for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, I just shortly introduced myself. My name is Lukas Titon. I'm working here at Verbund as a project manager for this new storage technologies. Maybe to my background, I'm a technical chemist, so a chemical engineer. Um, mostly here at Verbund, I'm working in the field of technology evaluation. So I do this technology scouting here at the corporate innovation and new business. And we are, as Carl, I'm sure already mentioned, starting pilot projects with uh, selected partners. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lucas. So uh, for the companies that are going to present, you have five minutes. And just to be fair with all the companies, I'm going to really cut you at the, the if you go out beyond your time. Uh, and, um, and then we have for each panelist one question. So that's how it is. So we are going to start with a Norwegian company, Magnus from Energy Nest. Uh, meanwhile, he puts his presentation on for the ones that arrived just after I talked about our event in Copenhagen, October 10th. Uh, so do take a look at the link that I'm going to post now in the chat. And also for the VC, CVCs and industries out there that are joining our presentation today, this one uh, is open, but normally these events are closed only for our members. So take a look uh, about becoming a member, reach out to me and uh, be happy to give you a tour of what we do. Magnus, you have your yeah. five minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does it work? You can see yes. your screen. You can hear me. <laughs> yes. Perfect. So my name is Magnus. I'm with Energy Nest since a little bit more than two years. I'm in charge of the business development uh, there. So my job is basically to present our technology, tell everybody how great it is, and try to develop products and convince customers. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about our product and what, what are we trying to do, where are we trying to go, and a little bit what is the status of our deployment and uh, the rollout into the market. So as you know, Energyness has been around for quite a long time. We started 2011. It was all a great idea. It took a lot of time to refine it and develop it and demonstrate it. But this we have actually managed to do now, so we have a commercial product. So we focus on four different areas where we can apply and install our, our thermal energy storage. So it's primarily electrification of industry, providing industry, industries with heat, providing them with steam. We can do this directly, so we do it very cost efficiently. We also help renewable developers to be more uh, flexible and find more offtakes because sometimes you have stranded renewables that doesn't really are monetized fully so we can actually help help these developers to to find offtakers and then also help them to supply more electricity into these offtakers by converting it and time shifting it into heat and with all of these renewables we also have the the challenge in the grid balancing we can provide excellent help here by, by providing frequency regulation services from our, our equipment and our solutions. So we help for balancing the grid. And also finally, we can also make power plants more flexible by directly integrating our system into the steam water cycle. So this means there are many ways of utilizing the, the thermal energy storage. We have proven several of these way now, so we are very proud where we are today. So our main idea is to time shift energy and convert it into heat. So process heat, this can be either a thermal oil system or a steam system. We do this directly, so we integrate directly into what the, what the customer already have existing on site. So we minimize the number of equipment he need, and we also make it simple. We are maybe not the most clever people in this meeting, but we do things that we understand, and we do things that our customers understand. So what we do is the customers, they don't have to worry how is the energy produced. We take care of that and they just need to worry when do they need their energy and then we will dispatch it. So that means we are available 24 seven. We can ramp up and down very quickly, both on the demand side and on the, on the electricity supply side. We don't only do electricity or electrification. We can also work on waste heat recovery. This is where, when you recover waste heat from industrial processes. Uh, you need a big, nice heat exchanger in this case. You take the heat, uh, you take the heat from the flue gas, convert it into something that is usable, and then with the storage, with the thermal energy storage, you can actually then operate it much easier, and you can also dispatch uh, the energy when you need it, not when it's available. We also do steam grid balancing. This is what I'm going to show on the next slide. This is a, pl a plant we already have in operation since last year with Yara in Norway. 
it's working very well. So we have we have been accumulating a lot of operating hours now, building confidence in our technology and being confident that it actually works and it actually does what it's supposed to supposed to do. The last project I will talk about is the concentrated solar. Here we are in the end of mechanical uh, construction in our project in Turnhout in Belgium. Here, together with our project partner Aztec, we are building a solar field and a thermal energy storage and supplying heat to, to an industry that want to decarbonize. So the Jara project in Jara, this has been in operation since last year. We have collected a little bit more than 2,000 cycles now. We still have a long way to go until end of life, 460,000 cycles, but we are already on the way. And what, what, what this has helped us to do is to demonstrate our steam solution works. Uh, it can be integrated. It provides a lot of operational benefits. So this teeny tiny storage that is roughly four megawatt hours on an annual basis, Yara is saving more than one gigawatt of steam that we would have dumped otherwise. So this product has a payback time in within months, uh, not within years. So saying that the long duration energy storage is expensive, it's not always true. There are very good cases of where we can demonstrate that it's actually very profitable. Uh, a, a few pictures showing... Yeah, I'm almost done. I only have one more slide. <laughs> so this is what it looks like when you build an actual a storage. You put the storage in the middle, you put insulation around, and then there's a little bit of balance of plant to make sure that everything is operating safely and according to, to what the expectations are. And finally, the project in Avery Denison. This is now since December. After that, we have put a, a lot of lot of insulation around. We have con concluded the solar field and everything is being connected and it's going into operation very soon. So my main message is that this is a technology that is available and it's it's not always ex as expensive as everybody like to say. You just need to find the right cases. And then we can demonstrate together with all our competitors and other suppliers of thermal energy storage in the market, that this is an essential technology that, that will help the decarbonization of industry. Now I'm finished. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so let's start with the panel questions. Uh, and since Lucas was the one to, to, the, to join us last, would you like to start, Lucas? Of course, thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Magnus. I have some uh, questions. My first question would be the storage media. So the working fluid is steam in this case, I guess. So water, but the storage media looks like a little bit like steel or something, uh, which that would be interesting for me. And also uh, you told us that the storage is not as expensive Maybe you could uh, explain what that means in yeah. terms of capex per kilowatt hours and also in the operational costs uh, during the yeah. operation. You have a yeah. lot of cycles on your current storage system. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, just a last question, maybe. <laughs> Uh, the energy density, which could be stored in the, in the storage media, would also be interesting for me and the round trip on that. Yeah, I, I hope I will remember all your questions now. <laughs> Uh, so basically, uh, energy density is depending on the temperatures you use to charge and discharge the system. So this is a project specific question. Uh, I'm happy to explore, but uh, with you for product opportunities, but normally up to 2.5 megawatt hours in a 20 foot container. Uh, round trip efficiency, this basically translate into O&M for us also, uh, is around 95% electricity to heat out. So on a 24 hour cycle. And when it comes to CAPEX, uh, here you need to understand that this is product specific. So obviously it's very difficult to say anything, but normally we can expect to be in the range of 100 to 250 euros per kilowatt hour of, of, of installed capacity, turnkey cost. Did you ask anything more? Oh yeah, so the storage material is, is uh, called heatcrete. 
it's it's like a cement, but then we or a concrete, and then we have put in a secret sauce to make sure it doesn't break uh, during the lifetime of the of the system. And it's actually this secret sauce that is the true uh, know-how of energy nest and how to manage the the high number of cycles without having any performance degradation or any operational issues. I hope that answered your question. If you have more, uh, feel free to to. Continue. Thank you very much. No. Um, unfortunately, we have time only for one more question. Uh, I'm going to pass that one more question to Ninon, if that's OK, Madeline. And uh, then we can to wrap up. We need to be fair with all the company's time. I agree. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Magnus, for the presentation. Um, Maybe uh, I would be very interested to know a little bit more about the specific use cases that you mentioned that could be profitability. What are the main driver? Uh, I understand that it's project by project, but could you maybe elaborate a little bit uh, on, on the specific use cases yeah. you're targeting to, to make yeah. sure you have profitability? Yeah, so I, I think what you have seen uh, in the presentations earlier today is that the main driver is actually the cost of the energy going in. Uh, this is a bit unfairly put together with the cost of the storage, which has nothing to do uh, with, with each other, in my opinion. So if you remove the cost of the energy that you use to charge the storage, because this you would have had to pay anyway, uh, then I think the main driver of the levelized cost of storage is actually the number of cycles you use. So you need to find use cases where you have minimum one cycle per day uh, in order to utilize the storage efficiently. So the product in Yara, we actually do five cycles per hour. So that's very different uh, setup and this makes it very profitable actually. Okay, thank you. All right, Magnus, if you or someone from your team could hang on if there are other questions being asked in the chat for you to answer. Otherwise, I know that you have a meeting soon. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, of course, we'll be in touch. Yes, um, thank you. Moving on to the next company coming from Sweden, uh, would like to welcome Anna from Mind Storage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cleantech Scandinavia, for inviting us. Of course. I'm so I'll let you know when we can see your screen. Yep. It's on. Is so everyone seeing uh, my presentation? Yep. Excellent. Uh, so my name is Anna Engman. I'm one of the co-founders and CMO of Mind Storage. We're an energy storage company that aims to enable the green energy transition. Uh, I think this is not something that's new to, to anyone on this call. We will heard uh, Julia and Emily and so on uh, talking about uh, the need for decarbonizing electricity production, uh, the fact that we're electrifying a lot of the heavy industries such as steel industry, uh, cement industry and so on. And that's really driving the need for renewables. And since electricity is the ultimate fresh produce that needs to be produced and consumed at the same time, that's going to put a strain on our electric grid and our electric system that's really hard to comprehend. Uh, and we're going to need huge amounts of smart uh, smart uh, flexibility solutions, but also grid scale electricity or energy storage. Uh, and as Yulia mentioned before, $4 trillion needs to be invested by 2040, which is really uh, baffling almost when you, when you think about it. Uh, there's loads of really good solutions with different optimal application areas. So mine storage is more geared towards grid supporting energy storage. Energy storage today is by more than 90% represented by pumped water. So if you have water in two different uh, uh, in two different reservoirs with two different elevations, and 
energy is stored by pumping water from the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir. Um, unfortunately, we're not really seeing a big build out of the traditional pump storage today, mainly because of the fact that it's fairly difficult to get permits because of fairly big uh, environmental impacts from these types of systems. So what we do at Mine Storage is that we look at the same principal solution and we use the same proven mature technology but we apply that technology in a more innovative way by looking at height differences below ground rather than above ground so we normally use a, a, a decommissioned mine an old mine as the lower reservoir and we store energy by pumping water from the lower levels of the mine up to ground level to store energy and then we when we want to generate energy Re release the water back to the mine via turbines. And that means that the mine itself becomes a circular asset. Uh, because of the mature technology, it's also really high round trip efficiency. Depending on how you configure this type of facility, it's somewhere between 70 and 85%. And it's the amount of water that really governs how much energy is stored. So uh, we say that the, the sort of normal size for mine storage is somewhere between 15 and 200 plus megawatts with a discharge time of between two to 12 hours. So really more geared towards the um, daily uh, deficiencies between production and, and consumption rather than seasonal storage. Uh, and, and to put that in perspective, a mine storage with 100 megawatt can support 250 European average households when it's generating electricity. Uh, and because of the really long lifespan of these types of, of facilities, so we're counting on somewhere between uh, 60 and nearly 100 years, uh, the uh, levelized cost of storage is really competitive for this as well. So us as a company, uh, we deal with the entire development uh, of these facilities. So we really we look at everything from qualification, including uh, assessing suitable mines, uh, ensuring financing during development phase, getting permits, overseeing the construction. And then once the mine storage is in operation, we also deal with uh, the asset management. Uh, we often get uh, asked if there's enough mines to scale this internationally, and and the short question or the short answer is yes, there is. There's more than a million decommissioned mines, so it's rather the uh, local need for electricity storage that's driving the scale up, not the availability of mines. So a mine storage can receive revenues from many different sources. Anything from the traditional electricity trading. Uh, so pumping when electricity is cheap, normally at night, and then generating during peak hours, but also through providing services to society. So ancillary services help to maintain the grid at 50 hertz, uh, providing grid stability services to grid owners, but also being a behind the meter solution to either a large energy producer or consumer, and that normally provides a baseline for the revenue for a mine storage, because all of these different revenue sources can actually be, be stacked and combined throughout the year or throughout the day. Uh, and that obviously puts a, a big pressure on us to make sure that we have a, a good uh, uh, intellectual property and, and a good system to, to govern how we trade with, with the mine storage. So. Uh, our intellectual property is, is uh, provided under an umbrella that we call the mine storage way, way of working, so our WOW. Uh, and that includes, for example, uh, our mine storage operator, which is a uh, software system that we're building to ensure that we optimize the revenues for mine storage. We also have a, a partner strategy that differs between between different markets and different mine storages or uh, SPVs. So for example, in Sweden, we're dealing with uh, an energy company called Merla Energi, where we're building three projects together with them or developing three projects together with them. Uh, in the US, we're working together with Dairyland Power Corporation. They're active in four US states. And at the moment, we're looking for suitable uh, sites together with them. Uh, so in our project pipeline, 
we have more than a thousand megawatt hours. And by megawatt hours, we're saying how much does one charging cycle contain? Um, so the projects that are likely to become live first are based in Sweden, we're a Swedish company, but we're looking internationally. And now? Yeah, uh, this is my last oh, slide. So we're, we're a small company, but we have a really broad experience within the power industry. And that's something that we believe is a, is a strength when it comes to really being able to scale our concept internationally. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So considering it was two minutes extra, I'm gonna open to just two questions, starting with Madeline this time. Well, thank you for the presentation, super interesting. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit where you are in terms of uh, the commercialization uh, to make this also very cost competitive? And uh, can you elaborate why you have such a specific focus on targeting Sweden and the US? Um, um, so uh, in, in terms of commercialization, um, uh, these types of facilities is not something that you normally build a uh, a demo project. So we're uh, we're aiming to build our first uh, commercial project, but on a slightly smaller scale. So it's going to be 15 megawatts and 30 megawatt hours, uh, but still commercially traded. Um, and we're hoping to start our first SPV uh, before the summer. In terms of markets, uh, we have we're we're looking at more markets uh, apart from Sweden and the US. That's uh, Two of the examples that I uh, wanted to show. I also mentioned the Iberian Peninsula in terms of projects that we're looking at. So uh, within the EU, there's a few different markets that really show um, uh, high potential. Uh, saying that we're we're still a fairly young company, three years old. Um, so we're trying not to focus on every market. Yes, thank you, Lucas. Do you have a question? I do. I would be interested in the advantage of the mine storage compared to conventional pumped hydro storage, as Verbund is quite strong in there. Uh, I think the biggest advantage is the availability of locations. So with more than a million mines, uh, you can build pumped hydro in, in uh, flat uh, areas. So normally you tend to have to limit these types of, of Oh, this technology to mountainous areas, and they're fairly scarce if you uh, if you look at many parts of Europe and the US, for example. So being able to build it in flat areas and oftentimes more closely related to the larger cities, I think is a big advantage. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. Um, now moving on to the next company coming from Finland, uh, Marku from Polar Night Energy. You there? There he is. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm seeing your uh, PowerPoint presentation, not yeah. the full screen yet. Again. Good. Okay, please, five minutes, you can start. Yeah, so hello everyone. I'm Mark Kulen and I'm the CTO and co-founder in Polonet Energy. And today I'll tell you about our, our sand batteries that are high temperature thermal energy storage that we consider as key technology in enabling solar and wind to grow. And in short, what we make are these high temperature energy, thermal energy storages that we call sand batteries, even though we don't always fill them with sand, but anyway, how we fill them with sand-like materials that are heated up to really high temperatures. And we consider our technology the most efficient and upscalable product in, in this field. And we have our first commercial application running and the second one starting off uh, in construction quite soon. 
And what we want to be is, of course, the, the market leader in these large scale thermal energy storages. And we want to be enabling uh, the growth of renewable energies as to, to as high a degree as possible. And to enable that, we're actually starting now a 10 million euro seed round. Uh, so we're raising funds to uh, to to enable growth in European Union and also to to enable R and D towards electricity production from the from the high temperature heat. And to the technological aspect, um, I said uh, we are heating up the the sand uh, sand or sand like materials uh, to to six hundred degrees Celsius. We make storages up to 10 gigawatt hours in scale and up to 100 megawatt uh, watts in, in discharge power. And uh, what's important here is that we uh, can use existing infrastructure. So these storages themselves, they are quite typical silos that we connect uh, to, to electric grid or locally to wind and solar farms. We use conventional resistors to in our patented closed loop uh, air air uh, heating system to heat up air that we pass through the through uh, the the storage medium in in pipes and therefore we heat it up and then we discharge with the same system to to steam networks to air uh, air uh, processes or to to district heating water or or almost any type of a uh, uh, heating application and well, uh, in this event, I'm really happy to see uh, other innovative companies, uh, especially I'd like to point out Energy Nest. We've been looking up to you uh, with your product. I think you have a really robust and uh, and a modular product, um, and you are able to provide really high high uh, power output to industrial needs. And what we want to be is uh, to the same problem. Uh, of, of industrial high temperature heat, we can we want to provide as cheap capacity as possible. So that's where we uh, kind of differ in, in the technology, and that's where we excel. So we can offer a really low capex for for the uh, heat capacity, but still we can uh, maintain a high efficiency and a useful form of energy uh, to to be fed into into many kind of networks. And uh, I'd like to point out the, the first commercial one that was a huge media success. You might have seen some headlines on that. Here, uh, I'd like to introduce Tom Mieronen, who's the other co-founder in, in the left, smiling. And between me and Tommy, there's the CEO of the, the local utility provider there. Uh, they've been really happy with the, with the first commercial application of 8 megawatt hours. Um, they did hope that they would have uh, uh, done a bigger one. Uh, but with, with another uh, Finnish customer, fortunately, I, I don't have the permission to say the name yet. We're soon starting to build something 22 times bigger. So 210 megawatt hours will be the next energy storage. And uh, it's kind of a, well, the diameter of the silo will be much higher, about uh, 13 meters. Uh, and it will be providing district heating to, well, to a local town. And uh, you've probably seen the headlines. Please keep following what happens in, in, in Polonite Energy. And maybe with some of you, I'd like to connect uh, to discuss the investment. The investment round would be really uh, great to, to hear more about the ideas and, and, and to uh, tell more about how we will be building this to, to a global success. And uh, now I'll be ready for your questions. Be happy to answer them. Thank you, Marco. This time, let's start with uh, Nino, please. Thank you. Uh, two questions on my side. Uh, first one, is there is some specific heat losses during the process? And second one, um, about the size of the, of the solution. Could you give us uh, additional information? Yeah, uh, so about the heat losses first, um, as we are using resistive heating to turn electricity to heat, it's more of a close to one to one ratio. Uh, so there's some line losses uh, and uh, 
uh, during charging. So we have uh, the storage and above it, there's the equipment. They, they lose some, uh, a few percentages uh, in long term. And then through the walls of the storage, the, the heat losses are quite minimal due to smart charging patterns and discharging patterns. So generally speaking, in a uh, in the uh, 210 megawatt hour storage, we are looking into efficiencies in the order of 90%. And then about the scale of the product, uh, the first commercial one was eight megawatt hours. Uh, it's like a four meter diameter cylinder, eight meters high. Uh, but the uh, future installations, our minimum size will be to uh, the 210 megawatt hour version. So that's about 10 meters high and uh, 14, uh, 30 meters in diameter. But the next scale up will be to 10 megawatts and, and, uh, of, of discharge power and about one gigawatt hour of capacity. And then, then the scale will be, in terms of meters, will be about 24 meters in diameter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madeline, do you have a question? Yes, so super interesting technology and I like the application here. Um, what would you say, how modular are your design to be able to scale so that you can make this repetitive? And the other one, what would you say are the main challenges uh, for you to scale as a company? So sort of start um, deployment and so forth. Where are you on the journey? Yeah, so uh, the two megawatt uh, or the 210 megawatt hour storage, that already consists of uh, kind of elements. We don't use a... Uh, block type modular design but what's inside in the two megawatt uh, 210 megawatt hour and the in the one gigawatt hour of storage consists more or less of the same elements so there's no physical limitations in scaling up the the walls of the silo will be just uh larger and uh it's uh quite replicable what we put inside and uh, and actually we use designs that can be built anywhere so uh, a local workshop will always be used and, and we won't be shipping a large arrays of pipes from, from, from any country to other, to other one. And that's actually an important factor in scaling up as, as we don't want to have bottlenecks in, in terms of construction capacity. And then the growth of, as a company, uh, we have our commercial application now ready, uh, all the drawings have be, kept us busy now and, and uh, all the plans, how the next one will be made. But I guess the 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 uh, uh, kind of uh, what's not getting us into the world as quickly as possible is that as, as a new technology, there's always the technology risk, at least in the eye, eyes of the customer. And then uh, after that, it, as it takes, well, six to 12 months to build the first ones, I think it will be the the uh, just the the slow uh, construction process and then waiting for results that will be so the technology risk in the eyes of the customer is in my opinion the most uh, difficult aspect. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Time for one question. Maybe just to keep it short, what's the real main advantage of your heat storage system compared to other sensible heat storage systems? Um, our design is made of off-the-shelf components that can be built anywhere with their low costs. Our capacity costs are between five to 10 euros per kilowatt hour of, of storage capacity. So if I were to point one out, that would be it. And, and still we keep a high, high efficiency and high output temperature and, and uh, discharge power. Super, thank you so much, Marco. There is another question for you in the chat. So um, I actually went just for me. So I'm gonna share to everyone. Um, going to the last but not least company back to Norway, I would like to welcome Camilla from Kyoto Group. Hi, Camilla. Thank you so much. Let me see if I am able to share my screen and you are. I am and you can see it full screen or not yet, not yet. 
now we do. All right, you can start. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we often hear that uh, the industry is hard to abate and it's a lot of challenges. It's regulatory challenges and it's financial challenges. I would like to give a little bit a different message uh, today. Our experience is that half of the heat in the industry is easy to abate. It's technologies available to decarbonize up to 500 degrees in the industry today. And our experience is also that the demand is activated in the industry. Uh, the, the industrial clients are eager uh, to decarbonize and to reduce the dependency on natural gas. And we see lots of activities happening in EU. So I would like to bring a little bit that perspective into here. And I think Madeleine touched about it a little bit earlier. We need to distinguish between and maybe increase the granularity a bit when we talk about the energy uh, transition. And if we start by looking at what is going on in EU, it's mainly new legislations coming into place who will really accelerate uh, the deployment of energy storage. So the first is the design of a new electricity market for EU, which is being developed uh, in, in the commission as we speak and will be voted in parliament in September and put into place uh, next year. And in this, we see that the electricity only uh, is over. It's when the only trade is electricity. Uh, in the new proposal that is being uh, moving forward in, in Brussels as we speak, we see that renewable PPAs with storage will be incentivized. We see that peak shaving products uh, that can, can take down uh, electricity on the grid when it's too much. We see that all member states will be mandated to put in place story, uh, targets for energy storage and to renew them uh, and review them every second year. Uh, so there's a lot of support coming into play for energy storage, which we should start to see the effects from already next year. And in parallel with this, we also see EU's response to the Inflation Reduction Act from US, which EU is calling the EU Net Zero Industry Act, where in energy storage has been identified as one of eight uh, uh, clean technologies that will be labeled strategic clean tech uh, technologies that will be given priority status and access to fast track permission, permissioning, funding, et cetera. So we see that it's a lot of support uh, coming uh, our, our way and the energy storage industries uh, way. And then I would also like to piggyback on what Madeleine says, half of the energy demand in the world is heat and uh, uh, almost entirely produced by fossil fuels today and, and contributing to 40% of the global CO2. So if we are able to electrify heat, we will solve a large part of the problem. And a good news is that it is cheap to store heat compared to storing electricity. So when half of the demand is on the heat side, there is no need to balance that first as electricity when it is much cheaper to store that as heat. So uh, that is why our message is half is heat and it's cheap to store heat and technology is available to take half of the heat in the industry. So our experience is that it's a lot happening and that is where our technology come into play. What you see here, I just wanted to give you a visual. This is our heat battery and we use uh, molten salt. Uh, so we basically heat up molten salt in the tanks that you see here with an electrical resistive heater. And then we discharge that in this case through a steam generator when the industry needs. And a very typical use case is that we charge this during the day. For example, in Spain, when there is a lot of renewable uh, available from, from PV, and then we continue to deliver steam to the industry during night so that this, the industry can decarbonize and produce 24 seven uh, renewable heat. And uh, just uh, before we go a bit deeper into this, we use molten salt, which has been used for decades in the concentrated solar power. So in this tower here, 
is used uh, molten salt to store uh, energy. And that is what we have carved out and built an uh, independent battery around uh, to be able to then provide and electrify and decarbonize process heat for the industry. I think that's my five minutes. Uh, so I think uh, I rather stop there. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, you're saving your minutes for the questions. So let's start this time with Lucas. Lucas, I'm sure you have a question. Thank you very much. Uh, my uh, question would be what temperature range you're operating at. So from this perspective, uh, which molten salts are used? Yeah, and so, what uh, scale okay. of storage you currently have? Yeah, so uh, this, the salt that we are, we are using a ternary salt that we buy from Yara. So we are operating in the range from 180 and the salt up to 500 degrees. The current uh, configuration we have designed for about 425 degrees because then you can stay carbon steel on the material and you can provide a much more, a co more cost effective solution. We can go up to the 500 with the salt, but then you need to make sure that there is a business case who is prepared to pay for that. So the current configuration that we have in the market around 425 degrees. And sorry, Lucas, what was your second question? Uh, what uh, scale of the current pilot projects or com commercial projects are? Yeah, so I, I can then use my slides that I didn't have uh, time to show you. Uh, we said we are we have started to commercialize uh, our technology about a year ago, and we are currently working with around 40 industrial clients around Europe. And you can see it on, on this slide here. And uh, about two, three weeks ago, we announced that we have signed an agreement with uh, one of the, lar the largest electricity companies in the world who are then taking our technology to the market. Uh, so what you see on this slide is the green circles is where that utility company has provided offers based on our technology. And the orange circles is where we directly have provided offers uh, to clients. And the white circles are where we are still uh, assessing and not yet uh, providing an offer to the clients. But we are working with around 40 uh, clients around uh, Europe. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Ninon, do you have a question? Yeah, actually, you you answer to my question because I I, I was wondering what what uh, geography you, you you are more targeting. So I have a response now, but maybe a, a question about the the let's say the typology of your client. Could you uh, give us additional information? Yeah, so basically every industry is using heat uh, in one shape or form, very often as steam, but also mm -hmm. as hot air and, and hot liquids. And we are focusing on those, those six, which has a significant heat demand, which is pulp and paper, chemical, uh, metals, uh, minerals, food and iron and steel industry. Okay, thank you. Maybe one last question uh, before Madeline. Um, could you maybe elaborate about the, the advantage about using uh, molten salts in new technology? Yeah, so I think, first of all, it's a proven technology. So a lot of the issues why we're introducing a new technology uh, has been dealt with for 10 to 15 years. And some of the cost out uh, have then happened. And it's, it's a much simpler solution than the CSP because CSP is going back to electricity, but we are staying heat as a value proposition. So it's a smaller scale and it's a simpler than CSP. So we are actually downscaling an existing technology, but applying that in innovative ways uh, to a new industry. So we are patenting this technology to be able to do that in a cost effective way. But I would say that the, it's good your questions because then I can use my slides that I didn't have the time to choose <laughs> to show. But I would say that it's proven uh, and the energy density. So you will have about 64 megawatt hour of storage on around 250 square meters. 
So it's quite a, a dense uh, uh, storage and uh, it's cost uh, competitive. We would like to, to contribute to the transparency because we need to build this industry together. So we are sharing our targets. And we have a CAPEX target of 40 euro per kilowatt hour installed by 2025, so two years from now. And we are on the CAPEX roadmap towards that. And the levelized cost of storage of below 15 megawatt hours. Perfect, thank you. Madeline, the last question. Yeah, thank you, Camilla. Great to see you. Uh, so I think we already heard quite a lot of good questions, and you know I have a passion for this uh, decarbonization of heat. But can you um, elaborate a little bit on your two different business models that you have uh, as Kyoto, and also how do you see the attractiveness within these 40 projects for the different two at the moment? Yeah, so we are operating heat as a service where the battery is then installed at site and we deliver heat per megawatt hour. Or we offer heat as a product uh, where the industry then buy the battery and operate that by themselves. What we see now with the partnership that we have signed, it uh, changes a bit because it becomes heat as a product for us. We sell the heat cube to that utility and the utility deliver heat as a service. Mm -hmm. And then we have a service agreement uh, with the, the utility or uh, the, the industrial player. So for us, with that kind of partnership, it's shifting towards heat as a product. We will probably sell more, but then the utility will deliver the, the heat and we will provide services. And we see that typically the la very large companies who are used to operating energy systems maybe would like to buy the heat cube themselves. But the small and mid-size, typically pulp and paper, corrugated cardboard plants, they don't want to have, a, uh, to, have to deal with the electricity market. So they are just happy. They want to produce their, their paper and get the steam. And they then are, uh, I would say, more interested in the heat as a service. So from, a, from an industrial client interest, it seems to be leaning a bit towards heat as a service. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you, the panelists, for the questions. With this, we wrap up this session, and I would like to, again, thank you everybody that contributed, that joined. Uh, I'm going to leave my contact details in the chat. So if you are out there and you want to hear more about Cleantech Scandinavia, you want to be connected directly to the people presenting the solutions here, perhaps you have a uh, interest in investing. So I'll, that's why we're here. So please reach out. And uh, I hope to see you all in um, Copenhagen, October 10th. So have a very nice end of afternoon and I hope you are enjoying spring. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you for having us, bye.